this session, uh, we are going to uh, give kind of introduction uh, uh, to look into the dark side of fintech, right? And we have some dark, dark fintech expert from U of Cambridge who uh, has a big class on dark fintech. And also uh, Leonardo has been dealing with, uh, from the BIS, dealing with big tech issues. So he will talk about big tech. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, two, two speakers to join virtually to talk about the dark side of the internet and also Marcus who just initially was on the program. We dropped him and he just came back 20 minutes ago. So uh, no slides, but he's going to talk about the dark side of AI. There'll be some questions and we are taking questions from the audience. Just raise your hands and we'll just uh, just pick up the microphone and talk. Uh, so, uh, Leonardo, you want to introduce yourself? Thanks a lot, uh, Julapa, for uh, the invitation to be part of uh, to this panel. I am uh, Leonardo Gambacorta. I am uh, the head of uh, uh, the, in, uh, the Innovation Digital Economy Unit at, uh, at the BIS. Uh, we develop uh, policy-oriented research uh, to, uh, to answer uh, uh, urgent question uh, from uh, central bankers in, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. We develop different uh, topics, uh, uh, fintech and, uh, and uh, digital currencies, uh, the macroeconomic uh, uh, implication of, uh, um, of uh, uh, technological advance, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, I, I, am, uh, uh, I have selected one, uh, uh, one topic uh, that uh, could be uh, of interest uh, to kick off the discussion, uh, that is uh, Big Tech in Finance, and I will give uh, uh, an overview of uh, the benefit and the risk of, uh, of Big Tech. Um, uh, so most of the discussion uh, that I will, uh, I will do can also be applied to FinTech in general, I, I believe. Uh, so big tech are venturing into, uh, into finance, uh, into the provision of financial services uh, for uh, uh, households and, and firms. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, new opportunities coming from, uh, um, from them, but also uh, a lot of uh, challenges that uh, need to be uh, fully investigated and, uh, and understood. So let me start with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the DNA of big, big, big techs. That is starting from uh, what, uh, what uh, is uh, the, the business model of uh, big techs uh, to fully understand the opportunity and risk. Uh, we know that uh, big techs are uh, large technology companies uh, whose primary activity is uh, uh, digital services rather than uh, financial services. Just to have an idea, uh, in terms of revenues, financial services is around 10% of the total. And the big tech business model rests on uh, enabling a direct interaction among a large number of users. So we have uh, e-commerce platform as uh, Alibaba or, uh, or Amazon. We have uh, uh, social media, uh, Facebook, Meta, for example. And we have also search engine as uh, Google and, uh, and Baidu. These are examples of uh, uh, big tech companies. Uh, that uh, have uh, all in common that an essential byproduct of their business model is uh, a, a large stock of uh, user data, uh, which are used as, a, as an input to offer uh, a range of services uh, that exploit uh, natural network effects, uh, generating uh, therefore further user, uh, user activity. And these uh, uh, data analytics, uh, network externalities, and uh, uh, interwoven uh, activities, this uh, DNA, uh, constitute the key feature of uh, their business model. And uh, these three elements, uh, they reinforce uh, uh, each other. Uh, you can see uh, from uh, this figure that uh, uh, in case, for example, of uh, um, payments, uh, that is one area big techs are particularly uh, um, uh, developed, um, they, um, they, they, they enter by providing uh, uh, payment services, uh, but by providing payment services, uh, the big tech, they, uh, they accumulate uh, additional data in payments, uh, and uh, therefore they can then uh, uh, develop uh, uh, credit scorings or understand better 
the characteristic of uh, of, uh, of people into their uh, ecosystem and uh, uh, increase this uh, the network externalities of the ecosystem uh, um, supply uh, new uh, new products uh, generates uh, generate uh, uh, new activities uh, create uh, further uh, data and uh, uh, developing this uh, kind of a self-reinforcing mechanism uh, that uh, uh, that produces a sort of a, of a loop uh, in which uh, at the center there is uh, uh, there is the data um, so this uh, uh, business model this uh, dna uh, loop uh, is a, a source of benefit but also of, uh, of risk uh, on this slide, you can see that on the, on the left-hand side, we have the potential benefits. Uh, one is uh, uh, definitely uh, better screening and financial inclusion. Uh, there is evidence that uh, credit scoring techniques based on machine learning and big data uh, have uh, outperformed the traditional models. Um, moreover, um, there is also a story of financial inclusion because big tech credit can serve uh, households and uh, small and medium enterprises that uh, would uh, uh, remain uh, otherwise uh, unserved uh, using uh, non-traditional uh, data and using other sources that uh, uh, are, uh, um, are considered to detect the, the, uh, the characteristic of, uh, of the potential borrower. Um, other positive aspects are related to monitoring uh, and uh, collateral. Um, there is, uh, uh, in this ecosystem that the big tech uh, create, um, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, most of the, of the, of the cases, uh, for example, imagine uh, a, a situation in which there is uh, um, an e-commerce platform, uh, there is a, a threat of exclusion for, uh, for vendors. So, um, there is a sort of enforcement for vendors uh, uh, who, uh, um, who uh, uh, obtain a loan to repay the, to repay the loan as soon as uh, they have the funds, because otherwise they would have remained excluded from, uh, from uh, this uh, ecosystem. Um, another uh, positive aspect uh, is, uh, is that uh, uh, because of the business model that is centered on, uh, on the data, uh, data is essential and tends to uh, replace uh, physical collateral in the provision of, uh, of loans. So uh, there is a, a sort of a, um, a new um, financial intermediation uh, in which uh, the data replace, uh, replace collateral. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the bright side, but there is also uh, a dark side, the potential risk uh, that uh, we can uh, encounter uh, when uh, big tech enter into finance, and one element of risk is certainly uh, market power, because of uh, uh, big cam, the, big, uh, the, the big techs can become uh, dominant players. They can uh, consolidate their position by raising barriers to uh, to entry, and uh, uh, this could be uh, difficult for uh, uh, new competitors uh, uh, that would want to enter the, the market. Um, big tech can also favor the distribution of uh, their own products uh, at the expense of uh, third-party providers. And uh, this is uh, something that, uh, for example, uh, in India has been uh, uh, banned. Uh, there are other uh, areas uh, in which uh, there are challenges uh, related to the misuse of the data and the digital monopolies. There could be possibilities of uh, uh, price discrimination and uh, rent extraction. There is also possibility of the exclusion of uh, high-risk groups from uh, socially desirable insurance uh, market and uh, problems of, uh, uh, for example, uh, cream skimming. Uh, you can imagine a situation in which uh, uh, the health insurance is provided only to healthy individuals. Uh, there are problems related to uh, sophisticated algorithms that could develop uh, biases towards minorities. And even in case in which there is an increase in efficiency, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, efficiencies are not uh, evenly distributed among uh, all groups. There are privacy issues and uh, threats to consumer privacy that could, uh, could be present. <clears throat> so I would like to pick uh, two uh, opposite cases that are two phases of uh, the same medal of the entry of big tech in finance to show you a little bit uh, uh, first the bright side and then the, the dark side. So on the, on the bright side, 
Let's start with some evidence on, uh, on financial inclusion. Um, this is a study that the BIS has conducted uh, together with uh, uh, Peking University in, in Beijing and the Ant Group. We have analyzed uh, uh, the uh, half a million uh, uh, small and medium enterprises in, uh, in, uh, in China that are uh, financially excluded. And we have uh, um, considered a situation in which uh, they have received uh, a QR code based mobile payment system. So at a certain point in 2017, uh, Ant Group provided to this group of small and medium enterprise a new technology for, for payment. And in these slides, I just highlight one of the results of the study uh, that uh, is uh, uh, what happened after the introduction of the QR payment scan code. You can see uh, on, uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, uh, the, uh, the duration uh, uh, from when the, the firms received the, the QR payment scan code. And on the, on the y-axis, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the probability for a firm of uh, having access to the big tech credit. And uh, um, this probability reaches 60% after one year, 80% uh, after two years, and 87% after uh, three years. But this is not uh, the, the, the end of the story, because uh, um, when then uh, the, the firm uh, uses uh, the big tech credit, it enters uh, into the credit bureau of the People Bank of China, and this produces uh, a, a positive signal uh, to the traditional banks. And therefore, also the banks uh, can uh, understand the quality of these uh, uh, small firms that receive a sort of a footprint into the financial system. And therefore, there is this spillover effect from the provision of big tech credit to the provision of bank credit. So this is a, a positive story, a story of financial inclusion. But uh, um, of course, as I, uh, as I said, there is also a dark side. And I wanted just to explain with this uh, slide uh, what, is, uh, what are the mechanisms behind the extraction of surplus by the big tech that could produce uh, problems in terms of uh, monopolistic use of data for, uh, for, for rent extraction. So here we have uh, uh, four cases. The first case is uh, uh, perfect competition. Um, we all know that uh, perfect competition is a situation in which uh, we have uh, prices equal to marginal cost and uh, the consumer surplus is uh, maximized. Then we have a uh, second case of uh, the pure monopoly in which uh, we have a, a situation in which uh, price is higher than uh, the, the marginal cost. There is a, 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 a part of the consumer surplus that goes to the monopoly. Um, and then there is a, a welfare loss that is indicated in this graph from uh, the, um, the gray triangle. Uh, what happens when uh, there is a digital, a digital uh, monopoly? In a digital monopoly, <clears throat> as uh, I have uh, uh, explained, uh, there is a possibility of uh, an efficiency gain. So maybe that uh, the price is reduced and we have uh, a larger quantity uh, that is larger with respect not only to the monopoly situation, but also with respect to the perfect competition situation. But if the big tech is uh, particularly smart, uh, they can detect uh, our uh, uh, demand schedule and, uh, uh, and uh, price discriminate uh, and differentiate the price in order to get uh, all the monopoly surplus. It could be even worse. It could be even worse because uh, if uh, we receive a lot of uh, additional information, our perception towards uh, the, the benefits of consuming certain kind of products could be uh, biased. And therefore, uh, our demand schedule shifts, and uh, we have not only uh, the, uh, that all the consumer sur surplus goes, to, in this case, to the monopoly, but a further loss uh, that is given by the fact that we are consuming more than uh, what is uh, actually uh, needed. So uh, let me just conclude uh, um, just with the main uh, takeaways of this uh, uh, small presentation. So. Um, business model of big tech is based on this uh, data network activity uh, feedback loop. Uh, the, this uh, DNA introduces uh, uh, opportunities uh, and, uh, and challenges. Uh, on one side, we have seen that uh, the use of machine learning and uh, non-traditional data for credit scoring techniques 
improves uh, uh, financial inclusion. And we have also seen that uh, uh, there is a new kind of uh, financial intermediation in which uh, data uh, replace uh, collateral. On the other side, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are some uh, ch new challenges and risk uh, because uh, uh, big tech, the big tech business model can really create uh, new risk uh, in terms of uh, market dominance, uh, price discrimination, uh, algorithmic discrimination and uh, privacy issues. So, what uh, public policy has to do? Of course, uh, uh, we need uh, to balance uh, the opportunities and the new risk. Um, the problem is that uh, when uh, we, um, we consider the big tech, there is one uh, new element here that is uh, data that is at the center of this business model. And there is uh, one new element that is prominent with respect to the traditional financial stability efficiency uh, trade-off that is uh, privacy and uh, consumer protection. And this uh, um, complicates things because uh, we need, uh, un, uh, we need uh, um, coordination, not only uh, uh, at the domestic level be between the, the regulatory authorities on financial stability, competition and data, but also at the international level because uh, uh, data have uh, no frontier. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Leonardo. Uh, so we will continue with the presentations and hold your questions to the end, but we'll take questions. Okay, so the next one is uh, for Tom Vatanian to talk about the, that was a dark side of uh, big tech. And we're going to look at the dark side of the internet and where we are going from here, right? Uh, so Tom will do it virtually. And uh... Palapa, thank you very much. And I hope everybody can hear me. I'm sorry I'm not able to be there, but uh, the people who brought you COVID have uh, fixed my uh, uh, inability uh, not to be in Philadelphia this week. So I, again, I'm sorry I'm not able to be there and be with all my friends. So let me uh, try to leave you with five conclusions that I have reached after working in this area for about 45 years and spending the last few years writing my book. The first is cyberspace is extremely insecure and a dangerous place to have all the world's sensitive data in money. Number two, the implications of technology are critical to the future of civilization. And the question is, who's going to make those decisions? Is it going to be big tech? Is it going to be government? Number three, cryptocurrency represents a transitional stage in financial technology. And I do not believe it's a possible landing place. Number four, technology will determine the future of democracy, human freedoms, and geopolitical dominance. Number five, we absolutely need a new set of guiding principles, a new regulatory formula to stay ahead of technology. So, next slide. Let me start by giving you a little bit of background. Um, um, I started at the Consultant Services Office in 1976. Uh, ARPANET was introduced several years before in 1969. And in 1977 at the Controller's Office, we worked on and rendered an opinion, which at the time we thought was the, the most sophisticated technological advancement in banking, and that was the approval of automated teller machines. And ATMs were established in 1977, and of course, proliferate today. Uh, in the 1990s, the internet, as we know it, was born. Uh, and in 1994, uh, Stanford Federal Credit Union became the first financial institution to have online banking. And why is that important? That's important because at that point, the internet and banking, all everybody in the world was connected all at one time to all the financial institutions in the world. And that was an enormous difference to when it, what was uh, the case when I started in 1976. In 1976, everything was done with proprietary networks. Nobody had an open architecture framework in which they were doing business. So that changed the world dramatically. And the pro but the problem up until that point was that no one had thought about security. 
And why had they not thought, thought about security? They hadn't thought about security because they didn't know what the Internet was going to be used for. When ARPANET was introduced, it was a sharing mechanism for research among four universities in the United States. We have come from that point to the most sophisticated online platform that we ever could have imagined, which, as I've indicated, is housing all of the important data and all of the important value on the face of the planet. In 1996, the first inkling of cybersecurity issues and security took place when President Clinton's administration issued PDD-63. And that document was prescient because it included everything about critical infrastructure. It included everything about cybersecurity, and it anticipated what was going to happen over the next 25 or 30 years, which in fact is what has happened. And so you take an insecure net network that was never meant to be used as we're using it today. And then you pile on things like AI, 5G, RFDI, the metaverse, and quantum, and you see that we are compounding problems. Many of the experts today say that we are creating vulnerabilities online twice as fast as we're resolving them. And that's a critical problem. And that's a critical problem because what we're doing is we're losing the balance between the enormous benefits of online financial services and online life, and the balance between those and the negative, the dark aspects of online communication and online living. Uh, let me give you two examples of things that I think are, are, are critical here in terms of understanding the insecurity that we're dealing with. I basically um, have been looking at AI very carefully over the last several years. Uh, there's a great book by Max Tegmark, I would recommend, Life 3.0, that talks about AI. And we've now seen how ChatGPT has sort of taken over by storm. Well, it's interesting to me that when ChatGPT was introduced last year, late last year, within the first 60 days, 100 million people used downloaded, accessed ChatGPT, some for fun, some for business, some for school, 100 million people. And the question is, how many of those 100 million people knew what they were downloading, what they were accessing, or what they were using, or what it was taking from them? And it's a little frightening when we come to technology and basically approach it with this irrational euphoria that everything is great and it all works out. Because the interesting thing is, I think we spend more time researching and studying, uh, uh, a, uh, for example, a, an oven than we do when, before we go online and download some of these things. So I think there needs to be some sort of resetting of our barometric meters with respect to the difference between security and benefits and the uh, bad things that can happen when we're online. Next slide, Josh. So in the work that I've been doing uh, over the number of years, including while I was practicing law, representing companies, and, and then a, a, a later in the work I've been doing with the Financial, Cyber, Financial Technology and Cybersecurity Center, I've had occasion to look at every single breach in the financial services business since 2007, and that I've looked at most of the large breaches that have occurred. And anybody who argues that the internet is safe has got to deal with the fact that almost every major corporation in America, almost every major financial institution has been hacked, information has been taken, money has been stolen, uh, and the scale of it is all extraordinarily different than what we had in the past. I mean, when I started in banking in the 1970s, the maximum amount that could be stolen from a bank in a bank robbery, which was the only way really to do it, was to pull up in a van and stuff two valises full of money and throw it in the van and take off. How much could you lose? Well, you could lose maybe $100,000, $200,000, maybe a little bit more. But today, everything's at stake because everything's online. So just then as an example, in 2021, $14 billion of cryptocurrency was stolen. $14 billion. 
That's more than was stolen in all the bank robberies in the history of time. So what we've got now is we've got an insecure internet with the scales have changed in terms of the risk we brought benefit. The risks have increased dramatically, but we haven't changed the way that we approach those risks in any appreciable way. Uh, and what, one of the things that I've sort of thought about along this line is what are the solutions to this? And I, I'll, I'll leave that to another day. I'll just summarize what I concluded after doing all this analysis research and representing companies for all these years. And that is, there are four elements to the solutions that are practical. There's a hundred solutions that are impractical and are never going to happen. Users online won't accept most of the solutions. But some of the solutions that may work, number one, increased authentic authentication and digital IDs. Why is it that we can travel around the internet any way we want anonymously, but in the real world, we have to have a license for just about everything we do? In fact, my dog has a license. Online, it's much different. Second, governance. There's hardly any governance to speak of online. In the real analog world, there's governance everywhere. Third, enforcement. We need to think in terms of cyber cops. We need to think in terms of enforcement. If your money was stolen tomorrow morning, and I think I'm pretty sophisticated in financial services, if my money was stolen tomorrow morning, if all of my securities, all of my deposits, all of my accounts zeroed out, I don't know that I know who to call. Do you know who to call? I mean, that's the problem. And so I think one of the one of the critical solutions that we should be considering is going back to secure private networks, the proprietary networks that were there in the 1970s, and you can't get on those networks without agreeing to a digital ID, without agreeing to governance, without agreeing to enforcement, and without agreeing to the fact that if you breach any of those rules or any of those uh, requirements, you lose your online capacity. Next slide, yeah, uh, Josh. I mentioned this in the uh, in the introduction. We ought to be thinking about who's making the rules in the future because I think I think that the rules are now being made by Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, OpenAI, Nvidia, and a whole number of other big tech companies. And frankly, I don't know that I trust those companies to make those rules for all of us. And I certainly don't elect the CEOs of those companies as I do my elected representatives. So we've got an interesting question here about what the relationship has to be between government and the private sector. And I'll get to that a little bit more in, in another slide that's coming up. Uh, next slide, Josh. So cryptocurrency, I, I, I wanna just say a few things about cryptocurrency only because I worked on Mondex and Digicash in the late 1990s. And those were called electronic money, digital money at the time. There were smart cards were introduced. And I went over to Swindon, England. I was invited to Swindon, England in 1996, 1997, I believe, to see the beta experiment by Mondex in Swindon, England. And what I learned from that experiment, and I interviewed people who were using it in the town. They had outfitted the entire town of Swindon with uh, Mondex-capable smart uh, cards and smart wallets and gave everybody 10 pounds to start with. And I interviewed a number of the consumers in Swindon, and I came, across, came to the conclusion that there are three elements to the successful uh, implementation of any technological product. Number one, it has to reduce cost. Number two, it has to increase convenience. And number three, it has to incur full confidence of the consumer. Mondex didn't do that. Digicash didn't do that. And they disappeared within a few years, even though... There were tons of articles at the time, you can go back and Google them, that said this is the money of the future. Is cryptocurrency the next money of the future? I don't think so. I don't think it's money. I think it's some sort of investment or commodity. And what it lacks in terms of being money, at the very bottom of any analysis, what it lacks is the element of trust that's provided by government backing. Without that, I think you've got real problems in terms of trying to determine uh, whether or not that can ever be money. Next slide, Josh. So 
there's a lot of people who believe that technology is going to change geopolitical parameters and relationships. And, and I happen to be one of them now. Uh, I think because of what's going on in technology, it changes the parameters of what we thought is economic power, what we thought is political power, and what we thought is military power. And uh, let me give you one example, just in terms of what's going on with quantum. Quantum computing may, it may change everything we know about computing, everything we know about security. For example, there was one study that said, if you take RSA 2048 bit encryption and run today a supercomputer, uh, a brute force attack by a supercomputer against it, it theoretically could take 300 trillion years to break the cryptography, 300 trillion years. A, um, a quantum computer with 4,099 uh, uh, qubits, qubits uh, could break that same RSA 2048-bit encryption in 10 seconds. So what does that say to us? It says to us that everything we're doing today to secure data and secure money may become insecure in the face of quantum cryptography. What does that say? What that says is, is that the one who gets, whoever gets there first is going to have a large amount of control in this world. Because if you get there first and you're benevolent, you can create the cryptography that will protect all of the form, all of the information that's out there from quantum. If you get there first and you're not benevolent, you can steal all of that information and read it. And there are now reports that Chinese are basically stockpiling encrypted material as fast as they can from around the world so that they will be able to decrypt it when they get quantum computing. Uh, next slide, Josh. My final point here is, to leave you with is that we need a new form of regulation. Uh, I was a regulator for eight years. I've worked with regulators all my life. I think they're now handicapped in terms of dealing with the new world we live in. I think the Congress has to relook at financial services, relook at financial regulation, relook at technology, and change everything about what we're doing. The cops and robbers approach to financial regulation only works so much. 95% of the internet is in the hands of private sector, not the government. The most important critical developing information and technologies are in the hands of the private sector, not the government. We need to have a new cooperative form of regulation that includes both private industry and the government, giving them both equal responsibility for safety and soundness. I know that sounds difficult and it sounds controversial, but I think it's the only way that we can go to ensure systemic stability in the future. And the last slide, Josh. I couldn't leave without talking about federal deposit insurance because I think FinTech is really calling the question on deposit insurance in light of everything we've seen uh, with Silicon Valley Bank uh, and the amount of people who are now banking outside of the banking business. When the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was set up, 95% of the financial services business was done through banks. Today, it's about 35%. Today, we have more uninsured deposits, far more uninsured deposits than we have insured deposits. It's an article in the Wall Street Journal this morning about Republic First, small bank, and the concern for one on uninsured deposits. Uninsured deposits are, are, have become a new hot button, and they're undoing all of the protection that we sought to create in, in 1934 with the creation of the FDIC. Uh, this chart, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but the chart basically says in 1934, uh, the FDIC protection of uh, $5,000 was essentially one ten thousandth percent of the U.S. GDP. Just to get some sense about the size of deposit insurance protection against the amount of money out in the economy. Today, in 2023, the $250,000 of protection is nine one million of the US GDP. So what we see is we have to rethink deposit insurance in terms of the amount of uninsured deposits that are out there that is only gonna proliferate as we get more and more into financial technology and is at risk every moment because of social media and the internet 
and the immediacy immediacy of communication that can move that money in an instant uh, before the FDIC or the Federal Reserve Board has any ability to be able to deal with it. So with that, I will leave you and hope you have some questions and again, apologize for not being able to be there in person. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for, uh, for including me in this conference. I've been attending this conference for, uh, for a few years and I've been privileged to be on the organizing committee of this conference for about three years. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we were discussing things. Um, the, the conference re really become really exuberant. Uh, there were uh, the current chairman of the SEC prancing around on stage explaining the benefits of Libra, and uh, things were uh, things were kind of going um, a little too exciting. So we we had an idea of maybe including a session on the dark side. Now, this session, given the, uh, the mood of this conference, banning crypto, skeptics everywhere, seems like we're adding doom and gloom to already a conference that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's already kind of uh, ending dark. Uh, so in this session, I'll try to, despite the... Um, despite the war in Ukraine, we'll try to share with you what I've learned from Ukrainian cyber warriors, which is a success story, which I hope that you will find useful. Uh, as you've heard, I uh, was born and grew up in Ukraine. I grew up in, I was born in Mariupol, the city that was reduced to rubble. Uh, the uh, maternity ward in which I was born, was shot at by the Russians, and you may have seen pictures, they won awards, of a lady on a stretcher who was about to give birth. Her child survived, she did not. Uh, during this time, uh, of course, Ukraine has experienced not just a large-scale physical invasion in which hundreds of thousands of people died, and millions of people had to flee, but also enormous cyber warfare. Uh, I'm a Cambridge professor. I, uh, I teach finance at the University of Cambridge. Um, I tried to be as helpful as I could be. So last year I built a course, an executive education course for Ukrainians, Central Bank of Ukraine, Ukrainian Securities and Exchange Commission, a number of fintech startups in Ukraine, bankers, really for two reasons. One, so people could feel that they're connected to one another and can, can, uh, connected to something, something that gives them help. Without Western money from the U.S., U.K., and Europe, and without Western weapons and technical assistance, Ukraine will be no more. So... Uh, I was trying to be a part of it, and I was trying to think of how I could provide a little bit of a technical assistance myself. So I built an eight-week course in which one week we devoted to cybersecurity issues, in which I had guest speakers. These guest speakers have subsequently presented to a class that I built for my executive MBA on dark fintech. These are for people who run businesses, mid-level managers who... Uh, are positioning themselves to run companies on a large scale. So as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the speaker who was, was preparing to give a talk in my course is actually putting it together in a bomb shelter as, uh, as an attack is happening on the city in which he is. And on the right-hand side, there is a senior engineer and manager at Google who is attending my class who says this puts things in perspective. Uh, this uh, individuals I've been then engaged with, uh, this, the, the, uh, the ones who are presenting, and, the, um, and they told me a story that I'd like to share with you, which has some lessons which you can find, hopefully, both uplifting and useful. On the day of the first scale of invasion, the person who was a, a speaker on my course posted a note on social media, a big tech company, asking for uh, cyber volunteers. Uh, within 24 hours, he received 
uh, more than 1,000 applications, vetted them, split them up into groups, and put them to work to defend um, critical infrastructure, banks, payment systems, and, and other tasks. All of it has been intact. The payment system is operational. The national grid is operational. Uh, banks are operational. All of it has been successfully defended and continues to be successfully defended. Here he is receiving the an award from the Minister of Defense and then participating, sharing his like, lessons in the NATO hackathon. So what are the lessons that they've shared with me that I'd like to share with you that I am turning into something that could be shared broadly with, I think, anyone who wants to, uh, wants to do something about it? One is Ukrainians have found themselves with limited number of people and limited technological capacity to defend themselves against a massive, massive ramp up and cyber attack. Now, many of business executives will find themselves in that position in that they have a limited number of cybersecurity professionals and limited resources to spend on cybersecurity to protect themselves against. So what can you do in this environment? A traditional way of thinking about approach about cyber defense is similar to sort of the architectural features of this building in which you have to pass through multiple security perimeters, but once you're on the inside, you're safe. So whoever penetrates the inside of a company basically can roam free. Now, that is, for that you need then a lot of resources, and the perimeter, security perimeter, could be sufficiently large. And so you will be penetrated somewhere, and once they're on the inside, you'll be taken down. That's a traditional approach, for which there is never enough engineers, and there is never enough computers and there is never enough knowledge about what's going on. What the Ukrainians have done is something very different. You do, they do not think, they did not think of themselves as being the, protecting the outside perimeter, and those on the inside are safe. They thought of everyone as being part of the effort. Everyone. What that means is that all equipment and all employees participate in it. Think of it as territorial defense units. Everyone is on reserve duty, basically. And when something happens, you're called in. How did they implement it? They, they've implemented it in a number of organizations. The way they've done it is that They've created a technological platform, which they, did, which they shared. And they also created, um, from that approach, a training approach. Let's say you don't want to a typical cybersecurity training, as you've probably been exposed to, is you have to go, answer a number of questions, and forget about it. Right? So you're never cold. You don't feel yourself like you're part of anything. It's just something that you have to do but you're not really a part of it. Yet, if your organization is brought down, you're going to go down with it. So the way that they've suggested to do it, depending on sort of where you are within the organization, you can start with onboarding. New people, as they're being onboarded, are being trained that they are now, from time to time, will be on reserve duty. Uh, not just the cybersecurity engineers, everyone who's joining. Uh, you can call internally for volunteers and say, if you'd like to retrain yourself and be a part of the effort, you're welcome to do that. It's like you'd be surprised how many people may respond within the organization. And these resources need to be synchronized. They need to be synchronized periodically through training and drills, and hence some of the exercises. Uh, the way that 
It's been nicknamed now, the way that, that we're calling it now, is building a human firewall. A firewall that consists of everyone who is on the inside of the organization who are synchronized through what you're seeing here is, the, is a platform that they've built uh, that they offer for free to Ukrainian government institutions and, and for charge uh, to companies in which you participate, you observe, it's a dashboard, you know where you are, and you're on reserve because it's just a matter of time before you get hit. But once you get hit, you know what it is. You no longer feel, and please no longer feel that they're on the inside and they're being protected by a security perimeter. And that's a healthier approach that they find found to deal with the issue of resources. Of course, you can outsource this to someone else if you have the resources. You don't need to train your employees. You can continue going with uh, uh, the way it's done now. Again, it's a matter of time before you get hit and then you'll need to change one way or another. Um, that's what I learned. These are the lessons. Um, they're operationalable. They require really a change in how things are done. Uh, what they also found is that this actually helps change and build a collaborative business um, culture and security culture within organizations, which is useful. You want to have a collaborative security culture within your organization because Otherwise, people feel that they were supposed to be protected and then they're unprotected. Something has failed. Uh, so this is not typically what I do. A lot of what I do is, um, is sort of math. This is more organization. But I feel that in the intersection of technology, finance, a lot of majority uh, by, by some reports about 98% of uh, cybersecurity frauds is for financial reasons, not for ide ideological or other reasons. Uh, so something was an organization that also need to change because the, uh, I can tell you as I teach it and I talk to experts, the uh, types that the, on the other side, on the dark side, there is an industry consisting of large actors, small actors, state-supported actors, private actors, uh, they merge, they change. There is a lot of talent flowing in there, a lot of talent. I'm monitoring how much talent is flowing in there. One of the things that I find somewhat unhappy is that if the talent cannot go and work for FinTech because for, you know, light FinTech, they may go work somewhere else where they can make a lot of money. And uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. So creating these opportunities also for that talent is something that uh, I encourage you to think about. Uh, there are a number of ways to operationalize it. Hackathons is one of them. Platform is another of them. But again, it's about the culture. We're in this together. We need to think about protecting ourselves. There will never be enough resources, and let's, let's work on it. I'd like to end with a quote from uh, Lake Cargos of Sparta. The city is well fortified, which has a wall of men instead of brick. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we actually ran out of time, but uh, just... Can, you, can I share about your story? Just a half a minute. So, uh, Andrea's mother actually was killed in the war. And so he's very sensitive about this and he's trying very hard to, work, to, to find solutions for whatever he could. But. Uh, the microphone's on. Oh. I think they hurt you. Yeah, <laughs> I talk loud. Uh, okay, so I think we ra ran out of time now, so we're just going to go to the next uh, session. But uh, So I think Gary is already gone anyway. I don't, oh, I think Gary is dead. I'm here. <laughs> Can you do one question? So uh, AI, you are expert on AI. 
How, yeah. What is the dark, dark side of AI and, uh, and uh, can it be used to avoid, to uh, go around regulations? Um, uh, one of the, I'll just very quickly, dark sides include misinformation campaigns. So large language models are really good at creating misinformation. They're not very good at detecting um, what is true or not. In fact, they're basically blind to truth. So uh, all the actors that were just mentioned, state actors, private actors, and so forth, are going to try to influence our election campaigns. They're also going to try to influence our markets. You may have seen the um, period in which, or the example recently in which somebody put out fake photos of the Pentagon um, on fire and that moved the market. I don't know if that was deliberate, but I'm sure people took note. We will see more of that. So we're going to see market manipulation using deep fakes and other kinds of misinformation. Um, we're going to see medical misinformation. There's going to be already is starting a, to be a glut of fake books, um, some of which, for example, give people advice about what mushrooms they should eat and, and their errors in them. And so um, you know, people are going to suffer from that. And I will also connect. I know we don't have too much time to cybercrime. Um, it's very important to prevent cybercrime, to have a culture of programmers who know what the errors are. And we now have these tools called auto GPT, which are basically large language models invoking other large language models at large scale. And they're not being sandboxed properly. So anybody who has like an iPhone app, if, if you write an iPhone app, you're limited in what access you have to user files and user data, the internet and so forth. Whereas these chat GPT plugins like auto GPT essentially have full access to the world and they can write code and they don't really have the discipline to write code that is solid. And so I expect that some of the things that we heard discussion of are going to get much, much worse very quickly because there's going to be more vulnerable code out there um, that people can hack. And so things are going to get a lot worse because there's going to be a lot of poor quality code. So I think there's actually a lot to worry about uh, with AI. We, we ran out of time, but we have to bring you back next year. Okay, you thank you.